Good morning. Welcome to Seattle Community Church Online Worship. My name is Pastor Brenna, and I want to offer you a special welcome if this is your first time joining us on this fourth Sunday in Lent. As we use this season to follow Jesus closer to the cross, there are a number of ways for you to connect with God and with your community here at SCC. The first way you can do this is by participating in our SAC Lunch Ministry. It's a chance for you and your family to make lunches and serve the unhoused here in Seattle. You can sign up online or through our Thursday emailer. The second way to connect is through participating in our book club this month. They'll be reading The Heart's Invisible Furies. If you are interested in being a part of the book club, you can email ministry at seattlechurch.org and Bo will make sure to get you signed up. The third way is through our Good Friday service. This year on April 2nd, we will join together on YouTube Live at 7.30 p.m. and we will worship God. We will contemplate what it means for Jesus to have gone to the cross to sacrifice his life for you and for me. And the last way that you can feel connected in this time is through our amazing teacher, Esther, who is, wants to make sure that you and your kids have a great Easter. She has a number of ways that she is planning to make sure it's a fun season. And if you want to hear the whole announcement, you can go back to last week's service and listen to it there. But a few quick things to remember. If you are going to participate with your kids in the Easter video, please make sure those are uploaded by March 29th. And then if you want to sign up for that Easter basket delivery that is going to be such a wonderful surprise, please do that as soon as possible. Uh, Teacher Esther has to make sure that she has the right number, so please, please, please make sure you sign up. And then if you are going to join her and the teachers for our Easter egg extravaganza on Zoom on April 4th from noon to 1, please make sure you sign up on that Google form as well so that they know who to expect. Friends, we are here to worship the God of the universe together. Let us lift our hearts in praise and gratitude. Good morning. My name is Tony Song, and I'm one of the worship directors here at Seattle Community Church. I want to teach you a new song about God's love for the world and eternal life for us. Believe in him. Let's sing it together. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. The water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Let's sing together. For God so loved. The world that he gave us is one and only Son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever Of his 
Thank you for worshiping with us. Will you please greet one another in the name of Jesus during this passing of the peace? Peace be with you. Hey, everybody. It's Pastor Mike here. It's so wonderful to see your faces um, again. And uh, I know you have to look at mine. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, but you can't see me because I'm in camouflage, right? So. Anyway, I get the privilege of uh, praying before the sermon, so if you'll join me. Father, um, right from the beginning, you have drawn us with your cords of compassion and your benevolence and with loving kindness, and it's that uh, that has separated us unto you. And as we move through this season of Lent, uh, may we just every day get a little bit closer and a little bit closer to you and um, be separated for a time from the world so that we can be uh, experiencing this life that you've planted inside of us and that you're watering and that you're bringing to fruition. Holy Spirit, we, we just offer ourselves afresh to you and invite you to do your work. We, we know you're inside of us. You're working, and uh, we welcome that, and we ask that you would now bless the message and uh, the pastor that's delivering this message. Let your hand rest upon them, and let your hand rest upon us so that these words would be spirit and life to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Once again, welcome to Seattle Community Church, and I am so glad that you are joining us this morning. And I hope that wherever you are, that you are doing well and that you are staying safe. Today, we are on the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. And I hope that in this season, that you are able to spend some time in repentance and also in making room for God in your life. To help us to do that, today we're going to look at one of the most famous passages in the Bible. If not famous, at least popular. It's a passage that's known even by non-Christians. Can you guess what that passage is? John 3.16. And we're going to look at John 3.16 and its surrounding words. And I hope that through these words, God will speak his message to us today. So... If you're ready, John 3, 16. Listen for the word of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. I think a lot of times what we forget is that this passage is part of a conversation that Jesus has with a character in the Bible by the name of Nicodemus. And the Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And Pharisees were a powerful religious group. They were a lay movement in competition with the priesthood. They were a political leadership group, meaning they had politicians and social movers and shakers in the group. They were a learned academic group, meaning they had scholars, people who, who were thinkers. They were a group of urban middle-class artisans, probably from our time, urban hipsters. So this was a very influential group of people. I think the modern reader paints a pretty negative picture of the Pharisees because along with the Sadducees and the Essenes, they were constantly seen in the Bible as people who were opposing Jesus. But they were actually probably one of the most happening groups in Jesus' time. So to think that it was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes that were in opposition to Jesus reminds us that it was the good people, the people who were taking care of their community, the best of people that opposed and turned on Jesus. So back to Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, but the passage wants us to know that Nicodemus comes to Jesus not in the daytime, but at night, in the darkness of night. Maybe he does this because he doesn't want others to see him associating with Jesus. But when Nicodemus gets to Jesus, he calls Jesus rabbi, meaning teacher. And this shows that Nicodemus accepts Jesus not only as a teacher, but that he is willing to accept his teachings into his life. But maybe Nicodemus is overcompensating for the fact that he came in the darkness of night, whether it's because of fear or shame. So maybe that's why he's calling Jesus rabbi, to, at least to show Jesus that he's on his side, that he gets him, right? I get you, Jesus. I'm with you. I get what you're talking about. Whatever it is about Nicodemus, Jesus throws down some serious theology. And I can picture Jesus smiling just a little bit and saying to Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, meaning born anew. Now, Jesus challenges Nicodemus' understanding of God's grace and God's power of redemption. Nicodemus, you think you know the truth of what it means to be God's people as a Pharisee and as a Jew, right? But let me tell you something that is bigger than your understanding. And Jesus says these words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. When Nicodemus hears these words, he's probably thinking, 
What does he mean? Everyone who believes. Is he including the murderous Romans? Or how about those dirty Samaritans? How about those filthy Babylonians or the Persians who took us away, our women and our children, and made us slaves? Is he talking about them too? This can't be possible. At this point, Nicodemus could just blow off what he just heard as a slip of the tongue on Jesus' part, or as something that he himself must have misunderstood. But Jesus doesn't let Nicodemus off the hook. So Jesus continues and he clarifies and he says these words. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus wants Nicodemus to know, without an ounce of uncertainty, that he came to save the world, meaning everyone, not just the Jews and especially not just the Pharisees. Think about how much Jesus talks about the world. For God so loved the world. God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus' challenge to Nicodemus is so radical, so beyond Nicodemus' understanding, so contrary to what Nicodemus grew up on, what he held to be true. It literally blows his mind and turns his world upside down. As verse 17 reminds us, Jesus' mission is to save the world and not to condemn it. As followers of Jesus, then that also becomes our mission, to save the world and not to condemn it. Going back to verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Within that verse, this phrase, for God so loved the world, is not about the quantity of God's love for the world, as many people read this, but it is about how, the way in which God loves the world, by the giving of his son, Jesus. It is about the sacrifice that Jesus makes to save you and me, to save the world. Here's a question that I have for all of you. Are you willing to make sacrifices in your life that others may be saved? I ask this question because this totally goes against the flow of our culture. Are you willing to go against the flow of our culture for the sake of saving others? Right now, the big thing in our culture is the cancel culture. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about how we unfollow people all the time in our life, especially through social media like Facebook. We put people out of sight and out of mind, out of mind, out of sight. Done. We're done with them. Our culture is so polarized now. It's either you are on one side or you are on the other side. I want to ask you, is there a place in the middle? Do you feel like sometimes you're stuck in the middle? Because I got to let you know, I feel like that sometimes, that I am stuck in the middle. And I see this because a lot of times people will come up to me and pe people will say, even in our congregation, Fred, you're so liberal. And they've already pushed me to the other side. Or they'll come up to me and, and tell me, Fred, you're conser so conservative. And they'll push me to the other side. I feel like I'm stuck in the middle. Is there a purpose and a place in the middle? 
whenever there is a divide in our community or in our politics. The middle is a place for building bridges. The middle is a place where people can come together. The middle is where love is shown and love is found. So I want to encourage you today, toe the middle. In the story of the prodigal son, the second son demands his inheritance from the father. He goes away, he takes that money, he goes away to another country. And he wastes that money in desolate and wild living. And he degrades himself in drunkenness and with prostitutes. And, and in the end, he finds himself sleeping and eating with dirty animals, then starving and covered in filth. He goes home to his father. I don't know if this son is even sincere in his apology to his father. Because on the way to his father, he's rehearsing in his mind what he's going to say. But before he even gets to the house, before he can even finish his apology, the father runs out of the house and meets him in the middle. If, I don't know, if I was the father, I don't know if I could do that. I might have been just sitting inside the house waiting for this son who has wasted his, his inheritance, his life, to come back crawling in and begging on his hands and knees. But the good news is, God is not like that. He runs out of the house, meets the son in the middle, and he hugs him and kisses him. Remember, this son is filthy, dirty, is religiously dirty. But the father hugs and kisses him. Our God is a God who meets people in the middle. A father who is without shame when it comes to his children. A father who runs out of the house to meet a filthy, dirty child and to hug him and to kiss him. Recently, there's been a lot of cancel culture in the news. The royal family, who's canceling who? I don't know. It's going all over the place. And I don't know if you heard about the Dr. Seuss controversy. And if you haven't heard, there's some people who would like to see Dr. Seuss books canceled because of the racist words and drawings in his children's books. And when I heard about the Dr. Seuss controversy, I got to tell you, it literally brought me back to some old childhood trauma I think that I had probably just buried deep in my soul. And I was surprised because it brought back these old images and feelings that I had, that I thought I had forgotten. Because I had grown up with Dr. Seuss books in my childhood in the early 70s. In fact, I learned how to read with Dr. Seuss books. But I got to tell you, even at an early age, I remember being hurt by the pictures and some of the words in Dr. Seuss books. It, it was weird because as a child, I loved his books. I loved the drawings. But at the same time, I was hurt by them too. It was very conflicting. And I specifically remember this one book and this one drawing and these words. And the book was called, And to Think I Saw It on Mulberry Street. And I remember my teacher and some of the kids who were trying to teach me English using this book and reading this book together. And me, myself, having to try to read these words, a Chinaman who eats with sticks, a big magician doing tricks. What's a kid supposed to do with that? 
I like the rhymes, but at the same time, I'm hurt by the words. It was very conflicting. The good news is that in 1978, after I had already grown out of Dr. Seuss books, they changed it to a Chinese man who eats with sticks and took out the yellow coloring from the Asian man's face and removed the cue, the ponytail off of his head. Like, that made it all better now. I'm not saying that we should cancel Dr. Seuss books, but why can't they, meaning the publishers, change some of the words and drawings that are so offensive and that are so hurtful to some, especially minority children who read them? It's not like these drawings are a Mona Lisa, right? Why can't they change these pictures? What and why can't there be some writers out there who come up with some other rhymes, right? Instead of a chi Chinaman who likes to eat with sticks. How about a little boy who likes to play with sticks? Or a construction worker who likes to lay red bricks? Or a basketball player who likes to throw up some bricks? You know, I just laugh a little because those of you who have faced such things, you know, sometimes you just got to laugh a little because otherwise you'd be crying because it's just too dang painful. As I said, I don't think Dr. Seuss books need to be canceled, but I do think that the publisher and the public that reads this bo these books need to come together in the middle and work this stuff out. If we are going to follow Jesus, we need to get ready to meet people in the middle. We need to get beyond this cancel culture. What would have happened if Jesus canceled on us. As followers of Jesus, we need to claim the middle as a place of healing. As followers of Jesus, we need to claim the middle as a place of moving forward. How can we bring people to Christ if we are not willing to meet them somewhere in the middle? to bring people to Christ, shouldn't we be willing to even go all the way to the other side to meet them and to share with them? Isn't that what John 3.16 is all about? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus talks about sacrificing himself for the salvation of the world. And what that sacrifice is to accomplish, he later talks about in John 12, 32, when Jesus says that through his sacrifice, he will draw, he will gather all the people to himself. John 12, 32 says this, And I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. That's what Jesus says, that through his sacrifice, that he will draw, that he will gather all the people to himself. Throughout the Bible, this drawing, this gathering, is an image of salvation for God's people. And if we are going to gather all of God's people we need to be willing to meet people in the middle. We see this, Old Testament and New Testament. Jeremiah 32, 37. See, I am going to gather them from all the lands to which I drove them in my anger and in my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place. 
I will settle them in safety. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Right? God wants people to be brought together, to be gathered. In the Gospel of Luke, this gathering is seen as a banquet of all people. Luke 13, 29. Then people will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. I recently got an email from Dr. Ray Bakke, and he reminded me how people were coming together and meeting in the middle, as we are called to do. And he wrote this. Pope Francis visited Iraq to provide hope and encouragement for the half million long suffering Christians that have survived 2,000 years. What makes this even more significant is that the Ayatollah Sistani greeted the Pope in his modest rented home near ancient Ur, where Abraham is thought to have been born and grew up. This strong Muslim leader announced publicly that since Jews, Christians, and Muslims all claim Abraham as father, these three groups are brothers and must be treated equally in all matters of citizenship. This, a risk the 84-year-old Pope and 90-year-old Ayatollah took after months of communication and negotiation. The Pope went to Erbil and nearby Mosul, about 200 miles north of Baghdad, where Jonah ministered some 700 years before Christ. This is soft power, wisely stewarded at great risk, but will reverberate around the world. Abraham, Daniel, Jonah, and the wise men who brought gifts to baby Jesus were from Iraq. This day is very special. This is very special. And there is more. As Ray shared, I also believe that there is more. There is more that God wants to do. There is more that God wants you to do to bring about healing and salvation to our world. And I hope that in your heart, as our world pulls us to one side or the other side and pushes others to one side or the other side, that you will be faithful in following Christ in meeting people where they are, in meeting people in the middle. Let us have a word of prayer. Gracious God, I lift up the people of this congregation to you that we may be humble to follow you wherever you go. Not just to the places where we want to go, but wherever you want to go. Lead us to people, to people who are broken, that we may bring healing into their life, that our relationship with them may be healed. I pray that the healing and restoration and the salvation which our world needs today may be done through the people of Seattle Community Church. So it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, it's time for our offering. Wherever you are, we encourage you to give faithfully. And thanking you that it is your faithful giving that really makes our ministry possible. Thank you. Thank you for that message. Church, let's sing an old song together as a response to the word that we heard this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die for us. Declare it together. I believe in Jesus. I believe He is the Son of God. 
I believe he died and rose again. I believe he paid for us all. I believe he's here now. Standing in our midst, here with the power. Let's sing it directly to him. I believe in you, Lord. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again. I believe you paid for us all. to come and bless us as we conclude our service. Hi everyone, I'm Jane, one of the elders at SCC. Now, Seattle Community Church, please receive this blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week!